Hello and welcome to Keep It Classical. Today we're going to talk about secular music in the High Renaissance. Music that was created to be heard outside of church walls has been increasing at a decent clip, and we start to see some really intriguing developments at this time that take us into exciting new territory. Let's get started. The last time that we talked about secular music, we had just discussed the Italians transitioning from the relatively straightforward ferrotola into the more mature and complex madrigal. These new madrigals took on more rhetorical maturity by more closely aligning their musical settings with the poetry. This begins a big shift in the marriage of text and music. Up to this point, music has generally reigned supreme and text has been seen as subservient to music. Or in other words, that text has been the vehicle for the music. Now we start to see music become subservient to the text, or where music is a vehicle for text. This new genre in secular music was so successful that it began to be exported to other countries, most notably England. In 1558, a book of Italian madrigals called Musica Transalpina was published in England. This name means music traversing the Alps. This publication included 57 different compositions by 18 different composers, including a few by Lassus and Palestrina. Musica Transalpina was a big success partially because the madrigals in the book were translated into English, which their new audience could immediately understand and enjoy. Let's listen to an example by Lassus called The Nightingale. By the way, if you want to know recordings of music that I include in my videos, I've put them in the description below. It was so popular that it inspired the composition of many native English composers to adapt the genre for themselves and compose original madrigals. While secular music did exist in England beforehand, including songs by William Byrd, new creativity exploded after this publication. English composers like Orlando Gibbons, Thomas Wilkes, and John Dowland started writing their own madrigals. What was most interesting about these new secular settings was that many of them were composed for either a soprano part with multiple voices or for a cantus voice with lute accompaniment. And because printing was still expensive and purchasing a book was a real investment, these madrigals are published in such a way 
that four or even five musicians could read from the same book laid out flat. In this example here, you can see on the left page the contus voice with the lute accompaniment below it, and beneath all that are the rest of the verses. On the next page, you have the alto, tenor, and bass parts, but printed in different orientations. The Italians, the English, and frankly everyone else in Europe composed madrigals and their other secular songs based on poetry about love, sorrow, nature, death, etc. But lest you think that these madrigals are all wholesome and innocent, you must know that many of them are coded allegories for sexual intimacy. I can't help but laugh sometimes when people say that music today is so raunchy and that music before was always sacred and innocent, almost as if sex didn't exist until the 1950s. It's absolutely not the case. I was taught in high school that literature in the Renaissance talked about death so often because the writers were surrounded by death from either conflict or plague or just not surviving childbirth. And while there's an element of truth to that, it didn't exclusively refer to physical expiration. Many poems that intertwine elements of love and death, for instance, are metaphors for sexual satisfaction. That is definitely the case with this madrigal by John Dowland called Come Again. Back in Italy, a few composers started to take their homegrown genre into new and strange harmonic territory. One of these composers was Carlo Gesualdo. Gesualdo easily has one of the most intriguing and unusual biographies of any composer that we'll cover. Gesualdo was born in Venosa, and after losing his mother at age 7 was sent to Rome to study and join the priesthood. Deciding not to enter the priesthood, Gesualdo would go on to marry his first cousin and focus his efforts on his only interest, music. Not too long after this marriage, however, he caught his wife having an affair with another nobleman. In a fit of rage, he murdered both of them on the spot. Despite an investigation with multiple eyewitnesses, the authorities determined that Gesualdo had somehow not committed a crime. After becoming Italy's newest and most eligible bachelor, Gesualdo married a member of the Este family in Ferrara. There, Gesualdo composed and created music with some of the best musicians in Italy. Eventually, Gesualdo would return to his family's home, where he lived in relative isolation. His main activities included composing music and hiring musicians to play and sing it for him. It's a tragedy that can only be matched by the highly experimental and highly chromatic music that he composed. Writing both sacred and secular music, Gesualdo takes tonalities common in Italian music at the time and takes them to some very thorny places. The harmonies are being stretched and tortured to the breaking point. When you listen to this music, it's hard to believe that it wasn't composed much later in the late 19th or early 20th century, but this truly is Renaissance music.
Giswaldo's music is a rare perspective into a tortured mind that we won't have the opportunity to see again for a few hundred years. And while it's disturbing to explore this side of the human psyche, it's important to remember that the human experience is made up of heights and depths, joys and sorrows, happiness and pain. Giswaldo's music represents those pains, sorrows and depths, without which we can't experience or appreciate those joys and heights. That's all for now, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, you should watch my other video about secular music earlier in the Renaissance. And until next time, keep it classical.